Hello there, sorry from 17 once again. This is my Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep critical difficulty walkthrough. We're playing as Aqua, we've just unlocked the Keyblade Graveyard, which for all intents and purposes is the end of this game. It's where things step up, it's where the final bosses go to, to die, it's uh, combat level 9, which probably means something in the grand scheme of the game, but it's been a while since I've played, so I can't quite remember how high that is. But I like this area because it, it was shown in the secret ending for Kingdom Hearts 2 and back then when I had no idea what that even meant I was so excited for this idea of this crazy Keyblade war and everybody wearing like sci-fi massive armoured suits and looking ridiculous with capes and stuff and then I played this game like 10 years later or whatever and then realised what it all turned into and it wasn't the direction I thought they were going at all I thought they were going full on like space crazy night stuff and they didn't. They kept it very Kingdom Heartsy, which, you know, there's a part of me that's happy, and there's a part of me that's like, I wish we'd have got that kind of Zone of the Enders crazy fucking everybody's in space and fighting and armoured. And, but, you know, we got what we got, and it's nice of them to show it in this game and give us an idea of what it was. And it still kind of teases that original idea, even if it still isn't, you know, the same. But it brings it into a universe which, you know, isn't very serious and... And, and dark and, and, and things like that, even though they do kind of try the best to give it that more mature edge, but then you're always going to have like the Disney stuff, aren't you? So it, it kind of softens it a lot. Oh, by the way, these, uh, these crazy tornado things that are chasing me at the moment, they have some pretty difficult fights in them if you're underleveled. Uh, if you're level one, you, you're going to have some tough times. Uh, my advice, make sure you've got gravity moves, make sure you've got magnet moves, and make sure you're in spell weaver as much as you can be, because it's going to really help. If you have the ability to glide and super glide, you can skip all of the tornadoes, but uh, only certain characters get those abilities, and I'm not too sure if, if Aqua's one of them. The good news is, you know, she is... See the damage we're doing to these people, by the way? These people have got big life. But the good news is, we've got some big magic, so we can do some, some really, really good stuff. As per normal, though, be very careful with these little fucking radish-looking beasts. They're one of the most dangerous enemies in the game just because they're so unassuming and they fire that disc of, of like, wind energy at you, and it does massive damage. So, get them launched, get them killed, get rid of them. Little wannabe has-been Pokemon, and, and then move on. This is an opportunity where you could use the shot lock quite a lot. You'll notice I've not really used the shot lock at all. You might wonder why. When I originally played Birth by Sleep, it was on a PSP emulator, and the shot lock really didn't work too well with the controls. It just kind of didn't work all that well, and I never used it. I learned to kind of play without it, and you don't need it. Watch this bullshit, can't even hit him. That was annoying as hell. But it must be said, it can be very useful. It is a very powerful technique as it drops us out of the tornado and then we get to go into another tornado with barely any life which is always fun but oh, I see it looked like I might have been able to get away from that and then it's like nah fuck that shit you can't get away from it but the good news is when you die you get a full heal and of course I did die so now I'm back with a little bit more life and we're building up the mines we're building up the gravity the transcendence and we're going to be going into spell weaver and cashing in on some big damage then again we keep going towards Blade Charge, which is another really good move, but I do think that Spellweaver is more pound for pound and damaging, because it's longer. But this is where the lock-on gets kind of confusing, so I'm trying to hit this dude and uh, not really having too much luck, it seems, as we get those crazy shoe guys. A lot of cool enemies in this game. The Universe were a, a nice addition. See that? Wow! Was that one hit? And it put me down to that? Yeah, you're going to have fun here at level one. But we got on the other side of it, got him killed, and we get to push on and get bummed by another tornado. As it fades to white, fades to black, and then it drops us back into this graveyard of doom. And it's coming for us. It doesn't care, and we're in it, and we're fighting. And that noise, uh, somebody mentioned it on the previous videos, 
it does, it's one of those things, I've just come off a recording session of God Hand, which I've not played for like six months or something silly, so I was wonderfully bad at that game again, and on that game when you were dying, it only shades the edge of the screen a little bit, it's not even that noticeable. This game, how the fuck could you ever not know you're in trouble because of that noise? Yeah, it's the worst thing, dude. I think Bayonetta was a little bit more overt than I would like it, but it was still subtle enough that it didn't piss me off too much. The best games for me are where the life bar is like blinking red, and it's just the life bar, so then it's not completely distracting me. Uh, I'm, I'm a big no-no person when it comes to... like I don't want the screen to go all messed up unless it's a first-person shooter, and I think we can all agree when it's a first-person shooter it's meant to simulate the kind of you know, fatigue and blurry vision of someone who's about to die. And that's the point of it, it's meant to be an optical effect to make it feel more visceral. In a third person game, it just doesn't have the same effect really. And they still use it, don't get me wrong, but in, a, in something like a, an action game like this, a character action game, where a lot of it is down to your ability to dodge, and your ability to dodge is 100% affected by your ability to see. So when the screen's all fucked up and it's vying for your attention, it can be really, really tricky. And I wonder what the evolution of that particular piece of feedback will be, because whatever it is, I hope it's better than what we've got. Because there's a way of doing it. Look at that. <laughs> Couldn't get me while I was opening the chest. Love it. There's a lot of fights here, though. So that's my level, if anyone's wondering, to try and keep pace with me. I've just hit level 26, which is pretty high, but it's not too high. The thing to bear in mind as well is if you're not doing great damage, for instance, if you come up to these next bosses that you're about to fight and you're doing terrible damage, it might be a good idea to put on the no experience perk. Not too sure if I've mentioned it in this particular run, but it stops you from leveling up, but it gives you a boost in damage. And a lot of the times, if you get through these campaigns quite quickly and you don't do a lot of farming and you don't do a lot of dying, and stuff like that, you're probably going to be quite low, slash, you know, not as strong as you could be for certain areas, and it doesn't mean you can't do those areas, because you definitely can, but popping that perk on can certainly make a difference. And I have no idea if I had to do it for this, but all, all you need to know is that the next few bosses coming up are really tricky, um, and I've got some pretty good strategies for them, but a lot of it's going to be down to your ability to dodge, your ability to keep you cool, and your ability to, you know, not choke. Thank you for watching, and you take care now.